You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Zach Subin of the Turner Center for Housing Innovation and Ben Holland of the Rocky Mountain Institute. Ben and Zach join us to talk about the report, Urban Land Use Reform, on the importance of land use and reducing travel and emissions. Stay with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by our wonderful, amazing Patreon supporters. Your support is critical to Talking Headways and Mondays at the Overhead Wire. We really appreciate it. To join this gang of zoning misfits and transportation rabble-rousers, go to patreon.com slash the Overhead Wire. $2 a month gets you some stickers and a handwritten note. $10 a month gets you one of our transportation scarves. Thanks so much to everybody who supports the show, from the bus drivers to the advocates all around the world. That's patreon.com slash the Overhead Wire. And for more information on our work and where to find our daily newsletter, The Transportation Scarves, our Cars Are Cholesterol merch, buy books from the authors that join us on the show at our bookshop affiliate site, or find our audiobook version of Raymond Unwin's Town Planning and Practice, check out the show notes on your podcatcher or visit theoverheadwire.com. Zach Subin, Ben Holland, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, thanks for being here. Zach, you helped put together the episode with Greg Schill right before the <laughs> pandemic. And Ben, you were on episode 336, so we appreciate you all coming back. That was a weird time. Uh, I feel like, Ben, we talked kind of in the middle of the pandemic, but Zach, we haven't really chatted since then, aside from some emails. How are things going for you? Yeah, that was a great event. And it was my last in-person event in March of 2020. We were all doing uh, foot handshakes, I think. That was the trend. At yeah. That point. <laughs> as long as we didn't touch each other with our hands, then then we were fine, I think, even though we had 100 people in that room. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad that was such a great conversation. Since then, I spent a few years at RMI, and we'll talk about some of the work that I've done with Ben. And then one month ago, started at the Turner Center at Berkeley to continue some of this work. Awesome. And Ben, we had you on the show recently, but perhaps you can remind folks a little bit about who you are and what you're doing. Yeah. And I think that episode was probably focused on the shift calculator that we produced that Mm -hmm. quantify the impacts of highway expansions. So yeah, I've been at RMI for past seven years, worked kind of exclusively on transportation climate strategies. In the beginning, that was largely focused on vehicle electrification, but of recent in the last couple of years, it's really been focused on kind of relationship between land use and use of mobility alternatives and reducing vehicle miles traveled. So we have basically a newly branded team that we're calling kind of the urbanism initiative. And Zach was really critical to getting that stood up over the last couple of years. So we're definitely sad to see him go. For sure. Well, Zach, how did you get into cities and transportation and urban planning and thinking about the environment overall? I've been interested in climate and the environment, I think, since I was a kid. You know, I was very precocious into science. And I remember all the scientists were telling us back in the 90s that we should be worried about climate change. I was nagging my dad to have a more fuel efficient car. Um, He wouldn't always listen. And um, (laughs) would have been nice if we had listened to the scientists 30 years ago. But here we are. I did climate science and policy at Berkeley for grad school. So I'm back at Berkeley at the Turner Center, which is a Berkeley affiliate institution. And, you know, so for a while I was doing global climate models. I was really having fun playing with global models, seeing what was going to happen in the Arctic in a hundred years. And then I kind of hit a wall where we just didn't have the data to really answer the questions I wanted. You can only play so much with computer models. And I thought maybe we should get back to solving the problem. So I spent four years with E3 in San Francisco before coming to RMI. They are an energy policy consultancy that has done a lot of work for the state government and utilities mapping out very big picture how do we get to a climate goal how do we get all of the carbon pollution out of the economy you know buildings vehicles power system the whole deal so i was running those models and you know still not much going on professionally in terms of housing and urbanism there was a class that i took in 2006 called sustainable communities while i was in grad school And that class was really frustrating because it was basically planners have realized, you know, since the 60s and 70s, that we kind of made a big mistake in this country, building low density housing oriented exclusively around cars. And they had all these great ideas of how to fix it. But it was basically, here's all the reasons why it's illegal and politically infeasible and never going to happen. So I said, okay, well, that was interesting and frustrating. 10 years later, I had just moved into San Francisco with my husband in 2016, couldn't avoid housing politics, living in San Francisco at that time, 
And the Yimby movement was rising and I, I kind of found my way to them. And Scott Wiener was launching legislation that was starting a national conversation around zoning reform, kind of putting these topics back on the table in a way that it didn't seem like previously had been possible. So I, you know, I was doing that in my spare time and I realized there was a big disconnect between what I was excited about in terms of building more housing in cities and making streets safer for people to walk and bike and more space to ride the bus. And the models that I was running of our energy system were very focused on adding up the appliances and vehicles and power plants without thinking about urban design. And I can talk a little bit more as we get in the conversation about some of the disconnects between the models that we typically use in climate policy and what people use for land use and planning and what matters for housing policy. But that disjuncture, I became aware of it. We actually organized a kind of subchapter of EMB Action called Urban Environmentalists and got to organize lots of panels. That's what the Greg Schill event came from, which I helped organize as a volunteer. And our first action was actually to ask the city to study the benefits of infill housing for a report it was doing on climate policy. So I kind of took those ideas with me and had the chance to kind of work about half and half at RMI on the housing and urbanism content and about half on the energy as a whole. And I guess now, I'm, now I've gone to nearly 100% <laughs> at the Turner Center. I first met Zach before he joined RMI and he was at E3 and at the time, we were just kind of talking internally, recognizing the the need to reduce vehicle miles traveled and sort of wondering like, what would the contribution of better urban design or land use reform be toward reducing VMT. And it was around that time that I met Zach and he was actually working on a piece called Building Urbanism into Climate Policy. And that sort of set the foundation for what we started to do at RMI from a housing land use reform perspective. That's awesome. Well, I love asking people how they got into what they got into because everybody takes their own circuitous route. And it's always fascinating to hear how folks get from A to B. And I'm glad that you're here at B now with us. <laughs> well, Ben, how's Colorado going these days? It's pretty good. As you might know, there's a recent effort to pass land use reform here in Colorado. It wasn't entirely successful, but looking at starting that up again in the next legislative cycle. But yeah, things are good here in Colorado. Awesome. Well, there's also some really cool stuff going on from a highway perspective, and we'll talk about that in a bit. I have some questions. But let's talk about your recent report, Urban Land Use Reform. When talking about climate action, why is land use so important when we're trying to reduce transportation emissions? So one of the reasons why we put out this report is that I think intuitively most people or most policymakers understand that compact, connected communities are better for the environment, lower carbon environments in general but that those policymakers typically lack the data or sort of a defensible argument from a climate perspective for pursuing land use reform. So what we wanted to do with the paper was to actually quantify the benefits from a VMT reduction perspective, as well as a number of other co-benefits, the benefits of instituting land use reform, and not only quantify that, but kind of illustrate what that would look like at the city level. So we chose three rapidly growing cities, Austin, Charlotte, and Denver, and used a tool called Urban Footprint to develop a sort of business as usual, suburban, single family driven kind of growth scenario, and then developed a counterfactual with a uh, heavy emphasis on infill development, TOD, and kind of broad up zoning, and really just painted that onto the metropolitan areas of Austin, Charlotte, and Denver and then spit out the metrics of VMT reduction. And it's kind of come up to about 13% VMT reduction per capita, a 16% building energy use reduction, and a 14% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. But the biggest finding for us was really the land consumption benefits. So compared to sort of business's usual growth forecast, our sort of smart growth scenario reduced land consumption by up to 82% sort of incremental land consumption. One thing to keep in mind is those percentage savings for the vehicle miles traveled, for the building energy, and for building and vehicle emissions. So those are with respect to the whole metro region, including all the people that are already living there who are basically not touching anything in these scenarios, plus the new people. So kind of per new home that you're adding, you're actually saving a much higher proportion 
And it's because these cities are adding potentially so many new people that you really get a significant signal even you know, at, at the whole metro scale. That's interesting because one of the things that struck me about reading the report was basically you all mentioned there's a flaw in climate action plans in that you address these fast-growing cities, but you're looking at things from like in an overall city perspective rather than the per capita perspective. Right. And I think that's really an important point to make. Yeah. So I always like to bring it back to San Francisco because it's the most walkable, compact city we have on the West Coast. It happens to be where I live. So I'm used to having the conversations there. Chris Jones, also at the University of California, Berkeley, has done some foundational work on the benefits of urban infill from a a climate perspective, meaning adding housing to existing neighborhoods in places where people tend to have access to lower carbon ways of living. You can walk to places, buildings are a little bit more compact. That means they have more shared walls. So you have less building energy consumption, less building materials use. And of course, you're consuming a lot less acreage of land per person. So if San Francisco, the way we normally do it, if they hire a consultant to model their climate action plan, what they typically do is they draw a boundary around the city. And they say, here are the emissions physically being emitted within this boundary. And here's a way we can bring these down over time. The problem is, per person, we're emitting a lot less in San Francisco than a more suburban part of the Bay Area or most of the rest of the country. So if I say, okay, San Francisco needs to build 80,000 homes, according to our state policy targets that the city has agreed to, that's going to make our emissions go up, according to this accounting, even though it will save more than that elsewhere. So From a global perspective, you know, carbon dioxide is a global pollutant. It's going to make emissions go down to add more housing to San Francisco. But the accounting that we normally use will just say that the emissions go up. And you can help by doing it per capita, but it doesn't totally answer the question. And I've yet to see a city climate action plan address this quantitatively. I have seen some, including San Francisco's updated plan. San Diego had a good example a year or two ago that have at least rhetorically emphasized the importance of adding housing in within the city for these reasons and stopping new super commuting and all that kind of stuff. But we don't necessarily have a great off the shelf accounting framework, you know, besides kind of the template from Chris Jones that that could be built upon for cities to actually put it on the same level of precision as the other strategies in their climate action plan. So that might be something that I might work on, you know, area for further research. But right now, the tools that we have is to do this, at least at a metro region scale, using a model like urban footprint or a similar model to actually capture some of these benefits. You know, one of the interesting things that we did when I was at Reconnecting America was, and I think Ben has mentioned this on the last show, but we put together this thing with the Center for Neighborhood Technology looking at like VMT. And if you plot people down in a certain TOD space in a city, what do the characteristics of those new people take on? Like what kind of VMT profile do they have? And the interesting thing, and I don't know if this has been talked about a lot since we did this, but was that, you know, if you put a suburban TOD down on a commuter rail line with maybe like 30 to an hour service or something like that, You could build it as dense as you want, but people aren't necessarily going to adopt the profile of the dense urban center where you put 10 people in that urban TOD, they're going to adopt that VMT profile, and they're going to reduce their emissions greater than that. So it's interesting to think about it from that perspective of where you put people is very important in, you know, you point to this specifically, but also where you don't put people is really important too. And you all listen to the show, so you probably have heard me talk about this recently, but I've been on kind of an ecosystem services kick where I feel like there's a lot to be said for keeping a lot of nature intact and thinking about it from that perspective as well. And I think that's a really important part of the report that you all bring out too. Yeah. I mean, I think, Zach, this might be a question for you as well, because Zach has been doing a fair amount of research at RMI, and I assume will continue to do so, but looking at what the benefits are of essentially plopping people into low VMT neighborhoods. And you've done that analysis sort of the national level and recently at state level as well. Yeah. And I think a lot of work still needs to happen there. I've heard people 
think that there are differences between what we typically use in terms of travel demand models per project and what you might get if you have some of the latest data at a neighborhood scale. There's a lot of new data sets out now that actually assimilate everyone's smartphone data to get real-time travel information and then layer on other, other economic data sets and so on. And so that gives you a different signal than you might get from a conventional travel demand model. So I think that's an area to explore. Kind of do you get a different answer because your travel demand model says, oh, these people are right next to a transit station and they have high density versus just observing how that neighborhood currently behaves. You might say, well, the best assumption is people already living in that neighborhood drive a lot. So if you add more people, they might do the same. There's another question that I am hoping to explore at the Chenner Center, and that is there's kind of a, a different version of the question you asked related to trying to optimize for both housing access and affordability, as well as the climate benefits. So a lot of the climate conversation has been focused around transit-oriented development when it comes to housing. That's kind of the simple story, you know, add people right next to a transit station and they'll be able to drive less. The problem is from a housing policy perspective, there's an increasing focus on being able to make reforms over much larger land areas. There's a scholar at UCLA, Shane Phillips, who has a nice paper arguing that you really need to upzone you know, much of a city, at least to a moderate scale, in order to, to have the potential to achieve broader affordability and to avoid some of the concentrated impacts that people sometimes worry about in terms of land value spikes. And the way to think about that is, you know, if you only have three parcels and you say, okay, these three parcels now, you can build as much as you want. Everywhere else in the city, you're not allowed to touch. Well, of course, those parcels, now their land value is going to go way up because they suddenly, you could do a lot of development on them. So that's gonna have a big local impact. Whereas if you, have a modest change to every parcel, now there's no sort of reason why you'd buy one over the other. So it tends to spread out the impact. And also there's just a lot more land area in the US that we've reserved for single family zoning. So if you wall off those neighborhoods, allow them to remain exclusionary, that really removes a lot of the potential to add housing. And it's really important to add housing in these neighborhoods, which often are very high opportunity. You know, this is where you often have some of the wealthiest communities in kind of somewhat more car oriented neighborhoods. So the question is, can we show a climate benefit still from adding granny flats, accessory, you know, also known as accessory dwelling units or ADUs, four plexes, six plexes, et cetera, in these neighborhoods, which are you know, one of the best ways we can think of for creating more affordable housing types without public subsidy. And this this really came to a head in San Jose a couple of years ago. There was a debate about what they called opportunity housing, which was their version of allowing fourplexes throughout San Jose neighborhoods. And some of the opponents were arguing that that would just create more traffic. We should really only be building in what they call urban villages, kind of you know, right on top of the transit corridors. So that's the question that I, I would like to answer it and some of my colleagues here. I think that likely you would still see a reduction in driving compared to someone living even farther out. Maybe they still get in their car, but they're going three miles instead of seven miles for a daily trip. And there, of course, there's still savings in terms of building energy, materials, and land consumption like we were talking about before if you can have several homes on the same lot. I think it's really interesting too, thinking about this from a transportation kind of capital spending perspective, you know, a lot of new light rail lines, and especially in the cities that you all have studied in Denver and Charlotte, and soon, hopefully Austin, we'll see if that still happens. I know that there's always a fight about that in the legislature, but you know, they, they build along a, a single corridor and then that actually puts a lot of pressure on that corridor, but not the rest of the region. And I think those extensive historically large systems like a SEPTA or a Boston or Chicago or wherever, they don't have those same pressures because the lines are everywhere, right? 
And so if you do it in one corridor, that becomes almost a problem. And then we get these big discussions about gentrification, displacement along light rail and those things. But part of a problem is that we're not building fast enough. And I think that's the same kind of problem with the housing situation too, is that, you know, you don't have enough housing, you don't have enough light rail lines, then the pressure becomes higher on the ones that are built and the lines that are built. Yeah. And that was something that we were hyper-conscious of and even worried to some extent, like we didn't want there to be this unintended consequence of our paper, like encouraging policymakers to just direct all their efforts to, you know, putting housing on those corridors, like very kind of uniform housing type on commercial corridors. From an emissions reduction perspective, it makes it fairly simplistic to hit those numbers because you're putting so many people on, you know, for instance, in Austin, the Project Connect corridors, we actually loaded the future lines, uh, the sort of idealized future of Project Connect into a uh, urban footprint. And then our scenario was largely based on TOD along those lines. And yeah, from an equity perspective, you're certainly not solving that challenge by just, you know, opening up housing on those commercial corridors. So that's something that we want to explore further as well. Right. So just to underline that, this study looked at idealized scenarios of land use reform to identify the potential environmental benefits. However, before you would actually pass, you know, a realistic policy, you would want to look at these equity questions, make sure that you have sufficient protections for tenants and complementary affordability policies, you know, perhaps do an equity analysis looking at historically low-income communities, communities of color, as well as doing a market feasibility analysis. Sort of if you change zoning, you know, what actually is going to pencil and how quickly. So all of those things would be additional topics for further research, as, as we researchers always like to say. <laughs> always more to do. Can you all tell me a little bit about why you pick these three cities? And they're, you know, fast growing cities, their populations are growing really quickly. They're places that are not the San Francisco's and New York's, and maybe people fled San Francisco and New York to a certain extent, the high earners anyways, for these places. I'm curious why you chose them. Well, yeah, I mean, you mentioned this, but yeah, rapidly growing all three cities saw population growth of over 20% between 2010 and 2020. A big part of the reason why was because the land use reform discussion is so heated in these cities. I mean, or they're addressing it and with new comprehensive plans or efforts to update their land development code. So for instance, obviously in Austin, there's been a long going saga with Code Next. Talk about some updates there, if you like. In Charlotte, they had recently passed a comprehensive plan or now just getting into the I think they just recently passed their land development code rewrite. And in Denver, there's been an ongoing discussion about updating a Denver blueprint. And then, of course, at a state level, Governor Polis has been uh, supporting sort of statewide land use reform. So we were hoping to kind of inform the discussion in those cities. We also acknowledge that yeah, these are different from San Francisco and New York. There may be more common this story of these kind of mid-sized cities a bit more common in the U.S., but we are also conscious of the fact that we need to explore the same questions in cities that are seeing depopulation in the the downtown cores or less rapidly growing cities and what the land use reform should look like there. I'm also curious about kind of the state level interest in this too. I mean, you know, you think about Texas and the preemption that's going on now, the Death Star bill that was recently passed and is probably going to get litigated where they tried to make it so that if any city passed a law or rule or anything like that, the state has ultimate say in whether that it's actually goes forward, thinking about water breaks for construction workers, those types of things. But how much does the state play into these discussions? I mean, North Carolina, Colorado, Texas, they're all fairly big states with, you know, legislatures that have a lot to say. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're seeing, and there are good sort of political economy theoretical arguments for why this is happening. We're seeing a lot of the progress come from state governments. You know, if you think about it, if you're at a city scale, you're really responsive to small groups of people. It, you know, uh, I suppose I can use the word NIMBYs here. Um, yes, you can. <laughs> but, you know, there are legitimate local impacts. It's kind of a classic case where you build a lot of housing, say, on one block. I mean, I would love to have more housing on my block and have more people supporting local businesses and, and so on, riding the transit system. But, you know, there may be some negative consequences there. Whereas the housing market benefits of adding affordability really accrue at a much larger spatial scale. The economic benefits of having workers that can afford to live and work at, at your local and regional businesses, 
So at the state level, states have fundamentally the, the constitutional authority to change land use. You know, they all the cities derive their authority from the states. The states kind of all passed the same templates for enabling zoning after the federal government gave them a template back in the 1920s or so. But the states could take that back. You know, there might be state constitutional constraints that make that harder in some place than others. But if you're a governor, you have every incentive to pay attention to housing affordability and transportation challenges and the effects on businesses at the state level. So that's potentially the sweet spot for doing these reforms. Federally, there is a role to play potentially, but the federal government hasn't taken as direct a role in local planning, even though they they did kind of create the template for it, encourage the template for it. And obviously, it's a much heavier political lift to do that. You're actually starting to see some things come from the Biden administration in terms of carrots to you know give cities a grant to do better planning policies. So we're seeing a lot of progress happen at the state level. In some cases, they are following cities that have the political conditions to get out in front. One other analysis that I was working on while I was still at RMI and and some of my former colleagues are still working on is looking across states what the climate potential benefits are of land use reform in a kind of generic cross-state analysis. So what we did was we blended data from the current housing shortage, projected population growth, and current patterns of transportation and energy in each state. And we asked the question, what if each state independently solved the housing shortage and built most of the housing in the lowest vehicle miles traveled locations in each state, right? So we're not holding it to a national standard, but within that state, what are the best neighborhoods now for where people don't have to drive as much for their daily life? What if we put most of the housing there and then how much potential emissions could we save after a decade? And I was kind of expecting California to be near the top. Actually, uh, in the draft results, Texas is, I believe, the biggest. And that's because you have so much projected continued population growth there. And the average amount of driving in Texas is pretty high. So there's a big opportunity to go from that high average to some of the best neighborhoods in Texas. Another interesting example, the other end of the spectrum is New York State. So if you look at kind of the best 10% of neighborhoods from a, you know, VMT per person perspective in New York, that's like you're in Manhattan, you know, you barely need to get in a car at all. So that that also could be a big, a big opportunity. But New York just hasn't been building that much housing or having that much population growth. So it, it wasn't showing up as highly. Should that change in a dramatic way, there might be a big opportunity in states like New York as well. Also, I mean, a lot of times I, I do get a little negative on the show, but there's been a lot of positive reforms, I feel like, coming forward in, in states. And I think that there's some really good movement. Do you have any examples of things that are happening in addition to you know, Colorado focus on highways and things like that? Well, Montana, of course, Washington, both have passed pretty significant zoning reform bills. I think that just overall across the country, there seems to be a lot of momentum in this space. So I think you're going to see some dominoes falling with regard to land use reform going forward. And then, yeah, on the transportation side of things, seeing a kind of growing sentiment that states are playing a key role in whether or not we're going to meet our climate goals, just whether or not they focus on highway expansions or invest in alternatives. So I think a lot of good things are happening state to state across the country. I've kind of lost count. You know, I used to have off the top of my head the states that had done significant land use reform, and now I I cannot list them anymore. Vermont passed a package this year, and a number of states have passed more incremental reforms, including New Jersey, for instance, Maine actually passed a big reform a couple years ago. And so we're seeing different states take different strategies in terms of, you know, do you reform the permit process, make it faster to get approvals? Do you change zoning to allow for accessory dwelling units? Some states are kind of following California's model of having what's called a fair share planning requirement so that there's not kind of a prescriptive requirement on cities. It's more you need to do something to accommodate your share of new housing 
And then, you know, there's some negotiation where you can fill in the details. And of course, California is just coming to the end of that process where cities have had to send their proposals to the state government, to the Housing Community Development Department to see if they're satisfying state policy. You know, speaking of those strategies, I think it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out in the following years. I mean, hypothetically, there should be a pretty strong kind of bipartisan argument here for land use reform. Of course, like we know that there's environmental benefits associated that should appeal to the Democrats. And there's, of course, a free market element to this that should appeal to kind of fiscal conservatives, if you will. Of course, it doesn't always uh, play out that way. But, um, you know, I think there's potential for that to maybe work down the road in uh, places like Texas and Colorado. Hopefully it doesn't get culture ward. Yeah, right. that's how it's been playing out, actually. So. <laughs> it's one of the few issues left that is really not consistently polarized along partisan lines. So we have support across the political spectrum and we have opposition across the political spectrum. And that's playing out pretty differently in different states without having a consistent pattern. And, you know, I think looking at California and Montana, they have both passed on the surface, including some of the same elements of reforms. I guess California has passed 100 bills. So there's a lot they've done maybe that Montana hasn't. But what Montana did pass this year, it was the governor had a task force last year to kind of pull all the stakeholders together. And they passed a lot of what was in the recommendations from that task force. And, you know, the rhetoric may have been different, but the actual policies have been pretty similar. I want to step back a little bit and ask you all about kind of the overall climate goals that we have and think about how the report fits into that. Because I'm curious, like what our overall climate goals are or where we should be getting to and then how does the maybe modest reforms that you're suggesting, how do those get to that final goal? So for RMI, Zach worked on this analysis as well, but um, a couple of years ago, we conducted some analysis looking at what would need to happen within the transportation sector in the U.S. to meet the climate goals set out by the IPCC's 1.5 degrees Celsius guidelines. Basically, like to put it simply, we landed on this goal by 2030, we'd need to have something on the order of 70 million EVs on the road, and then a 20% reduction in VMT by 2030. And then sort of that latter piece is where we've sort of kind of carve out what we think are the most critical policies or practices to reduce VMT. And obviously, land use is one of them, you know, shifting away from a status quo of uh, road expansions is another big one. So in a lot of ways, we've been kind of trying to put a stake in the ground within the environmental community on that VMT reduction piece. So I think most organizations recognize it is important. They just haven't really addressed it in a big way. Yeah. So that report that Ben mentioned, one of the interesting things about that report is, I mean, the, the VMT was kind of a, almost a footnote in, in that report that we then were able to build on. But the overall point of the report was, for 1.5 degrees Celsius, of course, this is in 2021, where we, we haven't made too much progress in the last few years. But in 2021, we were putting out there for the international targets, it's not enough just to say we're going to hit net zero emissions in 2050. What matters is cumulative emissions. So every ton of carbon dioxide we emit between now and then is what will ultimately determine the amount of global warming that we experience. And when you think about it that way, you can't just say, okay, but maybe by 2050, we'll electrify all the vehicles. So we don't have to worry about reducing the need to drive until then. You know, when you do the math, you actually do need to worry about that. And also, it's not just about the emissions coming from the tailpipe. It's from the whole life cycle, right? The vehicle manufacturing, which is going to be slower to be cleaned up than the tailpipe. When you're building for cars, it's not just about the cars, it's the whole kind of carbon intensive built environment that you're creating where you're using more land and more materials and more energy, like like I was talking about before. In California, you know, we have CARB has said, oh, we do need to reduce VMT, but that's everybody else's problem. <laughs> and it's right. frustrating, I think, when you see the agencies that maybe should be hitting the drum, kind of passing the drumstick. Yeah. I, I mean, ultimately, as we've been discussing, a lot of this comes down to local land use. And, you know, the Air Resource Board doesn't have direct jurisdiction over cities' land use. And I think there is a question there of have all the reforms the state's been passing been enough? Do we need more to better align our climate policies like the Sustainable Communities 
strategies law from 2008 to align that with our housing. That's something I think I'll be continuing to think about. I think in general, states have been making a little bit more progress on moving towards electric vehicles than reducing vehicle miles traveled. So that that really is lagging. The land use reforms that we've seen need to be scaled up much more. And it's a really hard political conversation to stop expanding highways. Even in some of our climate leading states like California and Colorado, it's still a big fight for some of the projects already in the pipeline. For new projects, at least, those states have passed pretty important laws that will, going forward, require you know the true environmental impacts of highway expansion to be taken into account. So that's good. Minnesota also passed a law like that a few months ago. So that's three states. So we need we need to see a lot more of that. And I think Ben has been working on that as well. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, I think, I mean, I probably mentioned this in our previous conversation, but there is such an emphasis on vehicle electrification in the in the climate community and, and understandably so and rightfully so. Of late, like a great deal of emphasis on getting states to adopt California's advanced clean cars rule, for instance, and adopt ZEV mandates. For me, it's just a big question of like how much teeth are attached to those rules in those states and how binding they become. I mean, I see the sort of VMT reduction work is very critical given the sort of uncertainty of the EV adoption going forward. So going forward, we're going to be working a big in a big way with states trying to uh, influence state DOT decision making. Again, kind of pivoting away from a highway expansion centric strategy to one that prioritizes transit and, of course, vehicle electrification as well. And and really kind of elevating the work that a number of community based organizations are doing within those states. Colorado and most recently Minnesota are really great examples of states that are adopting very aggressive emissions reductions rules and strategies. And they've also incorporated VMT reduction into that in a very material way. So we're going to be working with a number of states to try to adopt a similar approach. Are you worried about the inertia bump that individual vehicles just got with the ruling in California, you know, allowing AVs to operate 24 hours a day in San Francisco? I feel like we were going really strong and doing really well at talking about reductions in VMT and all those things. And then, you know, this bump kind of seems like the rhetoric and the the discussion about safe streets has kind of uh, overshadowed the discussion about VMT reduction and climate. I'm very worried about that. Um, as a San Francisco resident as well, I've been paying attention to this. I will say I'm definitely not an expert in autonomous vehicles and ways to regulate them. But I think it's pretty clear that the state preemption of local regulation, I could see why that might make sense for the state to regulate the technology, You know, to evaluate if they're behaving in ways that are safe. That's kind of a more technical question. But as you said, the questions around how are they using our local street space, what is the highest and best use of that space that is currently being offered for free, that was not in the conversation at the CPUC at all last week. And I think I'm skeptical, personally skeptical as a as a non-expert that they're safe. Yeah, but I, I you know, technology will you know continue to improve. They they might very well end up with a very safe product. I'm more worried that we're not having the conversation about do we need to have congestion or per mile pricing? You know, we haven't been able to get it anywhere in the U.S. yet for vehicles in general. Maybe politically we can start with autonomous vehicles because if people will find that easier to, you know, easier to fathom than applying to drivers in general. But I think we should be having those conversations. Yeah, this has come up on your show a bit, but the thing that scares me is just like the long term effects on like this on street design and the sort of quality of the pedestrian experience. I mean, you have the, such powerful companies that are going to be, you know, the, the expanding these services that could influence city decision making. You know, we need unencumbered use of the, the roads. We need to get rid of crosswalks. You know, basically interior urban roads turn into something akin to highways with, uh, you know, pedestrian bridges and things of that nature that are really not good for the urban environment. It's uh, it's you know, motordom 2.0, basically, yeah. as, as Peter Norton has said. And I think the thing that frustrates me about this, too, is like they, they've co-opted the safety discussion, but it is this issue of whether they're going to pack the streets. And I, actually, on my street specifically, it's a small street in Noe Valley, and 
It's narrow. It was probably built in the 1880s. And we have a lot of delivery trucks, but I feel like now there's way more AVs driving down the street with no driver than there were ever were delivery trucks. And so we've had this discussion about deliveries and just-in-time deliveries and same-day delivery and Amazon and warehouses and all that stuff. But now there's this other layer of it. And I feel like, you know, that's a discussion, like you said, Zach, that needs to happen, but that's not really happening. We're having this discussion about safety and about, you know, whether they should be allowed to test on on San Francisco. But there's a bigger discussion, I feel like, to be had about clogging a city with vehicles that take up 250 square feet each. Is there something that came out of the research that you all did in these three cities that you were working on that surprised you that you weren't expecting? I mean, I think for us, the big one was we went into it really focused on VMT reduction. And then, you know, the land consumption benefits sort of blew us away. I mean, of course, they're based on these suburban sprawl scenario that we conducted, I think is based in reality. I mean, we look, we actually used a lot of satellite imagery to determine where future growth was going to happen in, in subdivisions, places that have been kind of platted out that haven't been built on. So I think it's pretty similar to what you should expect in these three cities. It may be sort of at the extreme end. But yeah, the land consumption benefit is something that we raise quite a bit, and especially, you know, in areas that have like Colorado that have issues with sort of the wildland urban interface and and preserving wildlife habitats, that those kinds of messages are really, I think, compelling to audiences that wouldn't otherwise be supportive of this or otherwise don't really think about climate as much. Yeah, I think. It's interesting how in the environmental movement, it used to be all about conservation. That was kind of the starting point. And everyone now is laser focused on energy and fossil fuel emissions in a way that we've kind of forgotten about, about land. And, you know, if you think about it, even after we electrify all of, all of the vehicles and convert everything to renewables, you know, the one thing we're not making more of is land. So actually when we when we kind of developed the platform for urban environmentalists a few years ago we kind of put that at the fore that a lot of this is really about how we're sharing land who has access to it and i think in terms of climate policy there's been an underemphasis on thinking about the relationship between urban growth futures and what different outcomes mean for preserving nature preserving farmland and forest some of the very places that we're going to need to keep intact in order to cope with climate change and to serve as as natural carbon sinks. And it begs the question, what kind of policies are necessary to preserve those lands? I mean, in areas where maybe urban growth boundaries aren't possible, are there other policies we can explore? Because I mean, in our report, it sort of assumes that the future growth takes place in the downtown core, on transit corridors, or in low VMT neighborhoods. And it assumes that that suburban sprawl does not happen. Of course, we don't have really policies in place to prevent that. It's it's something that I think we need to explore more. It's also something that came up, I noticed, and I attended some of the hearings about the Colorado land use reform bill. And it was a question that was brought up by one senator. I remember, like, what policies are you considering to prevent that sprawl? And there just hadn't been anything incorporated into that bill. So that's a pretty tough challenge, I think. I think in California, we've kind of done the opposite. We've been moderately effective compared to a lot of the country at preventing sprawl. Obviously, we, we, you know, we are still sprawling. We did build a lot in the wild and urban interface. But if anything, we've been kind of a victim of our success in preserving a lot of open space, you know, around the Bay Area without tackling the other side of the equation to build enough infill in cities. And so that just shows up as a housing shortage and, and unaffordable housing. So you have to, you have to do both. Yeah. And I'd point people to listen back to an episode we did recently with Paul DePerna about basically pricing the priceless and thinking about how much those spaces that we want to keep wild, actually how much value they create for us, which is trillions and trillions of dollars, even more than real estate. But we just don't price it correctly because we don't understand the value or we don't figure out like what it does for us in terms of cleaning our air and those types of things. So there's a whole discussion about that too that I think is really fascinating. And I hope folks will go back and listen to that one if they haven't already. Well, now that you're at the Turner Center, is there anything you missed from your RMI days? Well, I've worked with some really tremendous folks. In terms of content, however, there was a really interesting session at our retreat in April called Solar Farms and Sage Grouse. So you may be hearing a lot of debate these days about specific sites to build renewables. 
And the idea of that session was we kind of need a both and we need the solar panels and we need to save the sage grouse. You know, the managing director, uh, Rashad Nanavadi, was, was kind of the brains behind the session. And, you know, the, there's a lot of questions there about tensions in the environmental community about building out this, this new energy system. Some of them are maybe more to the NIMBY end of the spectrum. Some of them are real legitimate concerns that we need to plan around. But the important thing is the whole scale of the challenge is set by how much energy we use. So it brings us back to the need for these kind of systemic efficiency approaches like compact land use. Even again, assuming that all, all of our vehicles and buildings are going to be electrified and all of our power is going to be coming from wind and solar, you know, if we can get someone to the store on an e-bike rather than a 3,000 pound vehicle, that's that much less land that we're going to have to fight over that we need to build a solar farm on, right? And it's that much less lithium that we're going to need to um, identify a geopolitically, socially, environmentally uh, acceptable way to mine, right? There's, you know, there's not a limit really in terms of the, the physical lithium available. It's a, it's a limit in terms of what we can access solving for those constraints as quickly as we need to. And there was a really interesting study from folks uh, affiliated with the University of California, Davis, earlier this spring that asked how much lithium are we going to need to electrify the U.S. transportation system? And they had kind of a worst case ranging to a best case. So the worst case is, you know, we continue with suburban sprawl and everyone has SUVs and we don't recycle our batteries. And the best case is we we do this compact development that, that we, you know, like to do uh, or the listeners on, of your show might like to do and we right size vehicles um, more to international standards. So, you know, bringing back some sedans and, and some, some smaller vehicles and we do all the battery recycling and that actually spanned a, a factor of 10 in how much lithium we need, right? So we're not talking about, are we going to electrify the vehicles or not? We need to electrify the vehicles, but we could use 10 times more lithium if we do it sort of the, the hard way, which is our business as usual approach, as opposed to putting all these systems efficiency approaches together. Yeah, it's a good point. It's interesting because some of the executives from some of these big car companies are starting to like think that way too, because they're like, oh my God, it's so expensive and hard to get this stuff. Why can't you people just now, we sold you these vehicles forever and now we want to sell you smaller ones because it's going to cost us so much money to build these stupid vehicles, the Hummer H2 and the Cadillac Escalade and all those stupid vehicles that we build now. Which is really funny because like they dug their own grave to a certain extent in that in that respect. So what uh, what's next for you all? What's the next rung on the ladder that you need to climb to get us to where we need to be? So on our end, a couple things I'm really excited about. Uh, we recently were very fortunate to receive a, a grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation for their Thriving Communities Program. That's essentially a program that's aiming to provide capacity building support and technical assistance to disadvantaged communities around the U.S. as they attempt to fund and execute transportation and land use projects. So we'll be working with 15 communities around the U.S. There are also, I should mention, there are three other teams that have a slightly different focus within that program, but we'll be working on that for the next two years. We're also getting ready to ramp up, as I mentioned earlier, some work dedicated to sort of influencing state transportation decision-making so I think that's going to keep us busy for a while. You know, for a while we were like struggling to get sort of external buy-in and around sort of urbanism related transportation climate solutions. I'm starting, I think that conversation's starting to change. You're starting to see a lot more interest in land use reform from a climate perspective and in sort of mode shift once again and uh, VMT reduction. So i um, very excited about the future there. Yeah, so I should introduce what the Turner Center is to folks who may not be familiar with it. So it's a housing research center at the University of California, Berkeley, that provides practical research. So we're trying to change policy, not just have things sit on a shelf in a, in a journal somewhere. Our focuses include expanding housing supply, you know, while supporting affordability, equity, and environmental goals. We have a homelessness research area. And my job is, is going to be to help build out a, a climate research area. I only started 
four weeks ago. So uh, <laughs> there's still still a lot to be determined. And I think climate and housing is pretty broad. You know, it, it encompasses, you know, reducing emissions, climate mitigation, as well as climate resilience. You know, how do you protect people from wildfires and, and all those types of questions? So I'm still figuring out specific focuses. The one that I mentioned, I, I am definitely excited about that question of being able to show or being able to figure out how we can build missing middle housing, mid-scale housing, while still having clear climate benefits. And I would invite your listeners, if you have ideas of interesting housing and climate research questions, to let me know. And maybe I can add to my my short list. <laughs> where, where should they send them? Um, it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I believe my email is on our website, turnercenter.berkeley.edu. <laughs> awesome. And Ben, where can folks find you and, and find the report if they want to get a copy or check it out? rmi.org. My email is bholland at rmi.org. I'm also on Twitter at Ben and Boulder. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us. We really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was a great conversation. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Orbit Wire and published first at Street Blog USA. Thanks to our generous Patreon supporters for supporting this week's podcast. And you can find out more at patreon.com slash The Orbit Wire. And sign up for our 17-year-old newsletter by visiting theoverheadwire.com. To get the show each week, follow along at your podcatcher of choice, including Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, YouTube, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, and many, many more. And if you can't find it there, you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. We'll see you next time at Talking Headways.